highest unrelated appraisers hired by a lender, paid for by the borrower to appraise the value of the property. So in a case like this, until a person goes to the bank for financing, they usually don't actually hire an appraiser. The person who hires the appraiser is a bank to protect their loan they're making. So we start a transaction that we think the building is being bought. The building is being bought for $10 million. Based on that, the bank promises a loan, 75%, let's say that's what the deal is. They're promising a loan of $7.5 million. Once the, the borrower agrees to a $7.5 million loan, the bank will engage and hire an appraiser. And the appraiser will come down to the property and look at the income, look at the expenses, confirm certain things, check out the neighborhood, check out the condition of the building, and then base, and then give his opinion. An appraisal is not a fact, an appraisal is an opinion of what the property is worth. And based on what's going on in the marketplace, an appraisal will decide. One of the biggest things that appraiser uses, that's the lingo you hear all the time, is comps, comparables, which basically means how did you form your opinion? What is it based on? So an appraiser will say, I formed my opinion based on the fact that the building next door had a seven cap and it's much nicer than this building. So this building shouldn't be, has such a low cap rate. This building is a 7.15 or 7.25. The building down the block is a little bit worse than this and sold for a 7.31. So it works out somewhere in the middle is where, and that's where he comes up with his value by comparing buildings to buildings in the neighborhood on comparables. Many, many times of the, of the typical argument when someone is going back to an appraisal to fight the appraisal value is to fight what comp was used and, you know, is it that much better, that much worse than the building at hand? So sometimes also becomes an issue is what happens if you're building the nicest building in the neighborhood? That's usually a problem. No building in this part of New York or this part of New Jersey ever sold below a seven cap. This guy built a class A gorgeous building in an area that typically trades at a seven cap. He says, this, this is standalone, it should trade a six cap. It's worth much more than the buildings in the neighborhood. That becomes typically a whole fight because you can't find comps to support it. So you, everyone agrees it's better than the best building. So the best building is willing to go at a 7% cap rate. And as we know, cap rates, the lower the cap rate, the higher the value. So this is a, bit, a little bit better than that. It should go six and three quarters, six and a half. However, sometimes some of the arguments become, and I remember when, when neighbors were changing, is that they would say, why don't we look at the next, the, the next closest city that has properties as class A? What do they trade for? What differential do they trade for from class B properties? So even though in that neighborhood, buildings may trade at a six cap or a five cap or a seven and a half cap, but what's the difference between the A and the B? And if the difference between A and B is 1%, then if this neighborhood we're in right now is at a 7% cap, then why don't we go out and show a 6% cap rate? So everything I'm saying is sometimes the difference is this large from a 1% difference from seven to six. But usually most of the arguments are literally like, you see one building trading at a seven, one at a 7.18, one at a 6.7, and then it's pretty close within the difference, and they go ahead and, and, they, and, they, and they make a decision based on that. But again, ultimately, it's an opinion. So some of the better brokers and better buyers in the, in the marketplace, when they su submit a deal into the bank, and they put in their quote, and they put a package together, they'll put a quote, why they'll put in their 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 opinion the buyer puts his opinion the borrower puts his opinion or a good broker sends it into the bank with comps and says this building is 10 million the reason why we agree it's, it is worth 10 million is because of these reasons there's a much higher chance that the bank the appraiser and everyone will use your comps because why should they go look for other buildings specifically if they have buildings that could back up the story that can help them out then they'll trust your information but ultimately, the main point over here is that a buyer and a seller, and a, uh, a lender and a borrower, before they go sign on to the deal, they want to get a third party to confirm and approve what the value is. And they'll take this deal to the market and say the, val the price value is $10 million, that's the value. When people are buying properties many times, and, and there was no loan, in no financing in place, which is very, very rare, less than 1% deals are bought all cash, then you could say, sometimes the seller says, it's irrelevant what the appraiser says. I'm selling the building at this price. Do you want to buy? You don't want to buy it. It's nothing to do with the value. Typically, an appraisal comes in when it comes to the lender. The lender is regulated. The lender is only able to lend you 75% or 80% of the appraised value. So the lender is able to tell you, 
is that I'm appraising the building for a million, ten million dollars. If it appraises for ten million, you got your loan. If it appraises for less, I'm proportionally cutting back the loan for that difference. However, an appraisal is usually the lower of ten million dollars your purchase price, seventy-five percent of your purchase price, or of the appraisal. It's never the higher of. It's never oh, it appraised for ten million five. I'll lend you another another few dollars. It's usually the lower of when they whenever they give a loan. That's the first appraisal. Second thing is insurance. Before closing on a deal, every lender will require you to have insurance in place so the property they are lending on is covered from certain risk. The, the typical purpose of insurance is what happens if there's a fire in the property. If there's a fire in the property, can you afford to rebuild the property to that level? Now, almost everybody has insurance on their properties even if they did not have a loan. The question is, they'll decide what level of insurance they want. What are they nervous for? Full replacement insurance. Banks have different things there that you could, different insurance you could buy. Full replacement, replacement just to a certain level. When you're going with a lender, they have typically minimum standards they're going to set forth, and different lenders could have different minimum standards. Usually, it's the same today across the board. Most, almost all lenders are the same, but there's going to be that minimum. And in the insurance, it's also going to be based on the, the, you know, sometimes the cost to rebuild it is worth more than the building is actually worth, the worth, and that becomes an issue. So you could have certain neighborhoods where real estate values are really depressed. There's a word like the replacement cost. To rebuild this building will cost $10 million. But since commercial real estate tr trades based on cash flow, the building itself may only be worth $6 million. So if I own the building myself, I might want to replace the value of the building. For 10 million, because I need a building that has income, I'll buy insurance for 10 million. Sometimes level, you could convince a lender, listen, you're only concerned about your loan. As long as I make you the benefactor of this money, if I don't want to rebuild my building, it shouldn't be your business. So your loan on the building is four and a half million to five. Let me just buy insurance for the four and a half, four and a half to five million dollars to cover your, your loan. Because again, what's the purpose of insurance? The purpose of insurance to, for a lender is to make sure they're covered. If the building gets burnt down, they're in trouble because no one would buy this property for that amount anymore. So they want you to be able to rebuild it and then you could sell the building, the building's there again. But you could tell a lender, what do you care if I rebuild it? I'm never gonna rebuild it at $10 million. Let me just buy insurance for $4.5 million, replacement up, up to that, and you get the benef benefits of it. Sometimes lenders agree, most times they're not gonna agree, and a lot of times they're not gonna agree because what if there's a partial fire? Then you run into bigger issues. Can't afford to go part of it. They're stuck in the middle, and then that's a big problem. Some are going through. So insurance, you know, it's not such a concern today because for the most part today, everyone, everyone that's sitting at the table is pretty sophisticated. So you're talking about years ago when it, before the internet and before real estate was really in a, in a very big way on the internet. You had people who had their own ways of doing things, and lenders had their own way of doing things. What streamlined the process today? As you said before in one of the in one of the previous sessions is that banks sell notes to each other. And because they sell notes to each other, many banks end up using general, the, 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 a typical way, the, the, a typical way deals are, are, are underwritten, a typical way deals are booked and loan docs, etc. So this way the bank's in a position, if they ever want to sell, they can sell. The worst investment that we said from the beginning, people view real estate as a terrible investment. It's called an illiquid asset. You can't at any moment snap your fingers and, and sell your building. If you snap your fingers and I want to sell by tomorrow, even if the building is worth $10 million and a fast close worth nine and a half, people smell desperation. Well, if you're nine, eight and a half, you're desperate. Stock market, on the other hand, for the most part, unless you own a huge percent of a company, you can just decide to sell shares and it can go in the course of the day. There's no issue. It's a very liquid asset. The most liquid is out of your money sitting in the bank. So because of that, when you're when, 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 when someone is in, 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 someone's investing, I'm supposed to train a thought here. When someone's investing and in, in going back on the, on, on the insurance part, when someone's taking out the insurance on a property and they want to, uh, I totally lost what I was. It's good on video that I have in there. But I'll go on, I'll get back to it. I'll, uh, I'll circle back in. So going back, going back on the next thing is title insurance. We discussed title insurance before and we'll continue on the title insurance here. So title insurance is that you're telling me you own this building. You're selling this building at $10 million. That's what, that's what you're selling this for. Who says you own the building? Who, sell, who says that the exact layout you gave me of the survey is accurate? Who gave me, who's telling me that all oh, this is true? Title insurance comes in and title insurance is guaranteeing 
and they're giving you the insurance that in the event that someone makes a claim later on that the property is really theirs or the property is not theirs, but they're owed money on the property and they're supposed to get paid back first, who's the person to go ahead and do that? Who deals with that? That's the title insurance companies and give you title insurance that you've covered. Legal is every party will need to hire their own attorneys to advocate and protect themselves from unwanted clauses. So in a legal situation is that in a typical thing, I want to shake hands with the seller, I'm going to buy the building. Many things come up between now and the closing. And what's able to come up between now and the closing is that they're able to come back to the table and say, there's a problem here. That I thought A, B, and C. Or I told you I'll close with this date, how long can I stick around for? But the reason why I'm not ready to close is because of something else out of my control. What happens, a million scenarios are about to what happened. And that's what the lawyers are there for, to protect that what you told you're buying, you're buying. Why don't you walk into the building after and if something was promised to you, it's not there. So every part of the transaction, so every part of the legal transaction is set up into place. Now that, you know, as I'm going through, I keep running scenarios in my mind, I'll go back to the, I lost the train of thought and coming back. Lenders today all make loans based on the fact that they want, I don't want to be illiquid. A lender today lends money out and have a billion dollars worth of loans. What happens if they need to raise capital tomorrow? The bank's in trouble, they need money. They wanna be able to go to another institution and say, I have a billion dollars worth of loans and I'm collecting an interest rate of 4%. Can you, I'll sell you 200 million of it. You give me $200 million and I'll have this $200 million, I will sell to you that instead of, instead of, instead of me collecting the, the, the interest every single month, instead it will belong to you and they'll sell the loans. But if they don't have one streamlined way how they do things, then how can the next, the next bank just buy those loans? It gets very complicated. You have to analyze every single loan and so on, so on, and so forth. So the most common way today is called Fannie Mae. Fannie Mae creates liquidity in the marketplace. So if you buy a loan for your, I take a loan out on your house, we take a loan out on a building, almost every single loaner, lender packages that loan. So if they want to snap their fingers, they know they could sell it to Fannie Mae. It's Fannie Mae compliance. So they did all the, all the requirements. They talk about insurance, they would want the same insurance requirements that Fannie Mae would want. They want different things that Fannie Mae would want, so this way they could sell the loan. Because again, even if they don't sell it to Fannie Mae, they might send, sell it to another bank, who what's their exit strategy if they're in trouble, and selling it out to Fannie Mae. So that's why in a residential mortgage, I just had this story, I don't do residential mortgages, meaning homes, but when a lender, many lenders keep the loans on their books, right? They borrow, they, they have deposit money, they lend money on homes, and they keep it on their books they collect the payments and they make the profits. But they all do it with, almost all of them do it with Fannie Mae compliance. And because of that, they know at any moment they could sell the loans to Fannie Mae. Fannie Mae has certain requirements. If you're buying a, a, a home, a condo, within a condominium, there's certain rules that Fannie Mae has in order for them to make that loan. That they have to have a certain percent of the building is owned by people that are living there versus investors that are renting it out to other people. So you, you can have a loan and then the bank promise you a rate. Oh, I'm buying a condo. I'm sorry. For this condo, it doesn't, it doesn't, it's not Fannie Mae approved. And all of a sudden the lender will either not do it if they're a lender that does not hold any Fannie Mae loans on the books. Or the lender will say, um, I'll, the only way for me to do it is keep it on my books. I can't sell it to Fannie Mae at any time. And because of that, I can't charge your rate at 4%. I'll do it at 4.5% because it's not Fannie Mae Compliance, I can't do that, that alone. So the same thing works with insurance and all other things that banks require. That's why they also want appraisers at certain levels. Like I go to a bank and I, I say, I want to do an appraisal. Um, how much does it cost? What kind of report, how detailed of a report do you need? And they'll say, I need the same report that Fannie Mae needs. So just in case I sell it to Fannie Mae, I can show Fannie the same people that you approve to do your, your appraisals in the same way they, they appraise the same things they work off. I use the same thing again so they can use the same valuation that I had. <clears throat> Continuing on is environmental. A bank, banks are hesitant to lend on a property that may have environmental issues. A full environmental report has two phases. Usually they will only require a phase one inspection. So here's the story with environmental. The problem with environmental is, let's say you have a dry cleaners and under the dry cleaners, they had all these chemicals were there for years. And this, and this issues, this who knows what happened to the property under it. The city could come in and say, you have to clean up under your building. The cleanup cost could potentially cost more 
than the building is worth. So imagine a bank gives a loan on a property and they find out later on that the owner has all these other requirements and responsibilities. This building goes into, runs into issues. I'm not even sure as far as who has first lien. But one thing is for sure, it became known that this building has a $200,000 cleanup. No one's buying this building at that price. So if, if there was a building that was worth $5 million, and better yet, it be a million dollar building. But there's a million dollar building as $200,000 cleanup. The problem we run into is, is that the building right now is not worth more than 800,000. Plus it's an unknown. Maybe it is, once you start cleaning it, you'll find more problems. So the building at most is worth 800,000. So your bank wants $750,000, a little bit of a correction, they're in trouble. So to protect themselves, they want an environmental report. So really what should happen is that someone used to come down to the building and start drilling and checking if there's any issues on, on any building. And then based on that, they get a clean bill of health. But they said it's crazy. The cost to do that is astronomical. It costs like $10,000 or $15,000 to do the full environmental. It's, not, it's cost prohibitive. You have that cost turned into a loan, it gets too expensive. Also, 99% of the time, it doesn't have all these problems. And on the one and on the, and on the on the one percent that it does, you could tell by just doing basic testing. So the banks broke it up and said, you know, something will only require a phase one first, and then if needed, a phase two. And a phase one, they would come down and they'd look around and do certain tests. And then if they suspect there's a problem, they'll require a phase two. So this way you won't, won't run into any issue. And the course is a, a, a pretty simple and, and easy course to get this done. However, what happened is, what happens is, and this is an important point, is that the, the environmental company is responsible to report any findings of environmental issues to the Environmental Protection Agency. They can't just decide, oh, we found the problem. Okay, you don't want to do the loan, we'll move on. <clears throat> they have to report it. So many times I find that when a phase one is done and they think there's reason to do a phase two, but they didn't find anything, many times a borrower would not do the phase two. They'd rather go to another bank that's not going to require environmental or require uh, or bring in a new environmental person to come down. Because once it's found, let's say they decide for their, their purposes, they don't want to clean it up. But if it gets reported, they have no choice anymore. So the environmental that comes in, so also sometimes, what I know in certain cases happen, someone comes down to the property, they do an environmental, they say there might be dot, dot, dot. This person will go hire a contractor and to do the cleanup before it's reported there's a problem. Clean it up the problem, and then go back, order another environmental, they wouldn't flag anything because there's nothing wrong there, and then move on. So this way they're able to clean it up on their terms and not on having the Environmental Protection Agency be there and deal with certain things. So, but a lender wouldn't let, wouldn't let, let a borrower or a buyer play in these games. Once something comes up, they have to follow through. So a lot of times that people do environmental, when someone's buying a building, they actually do environmental report by themselves beforehand because it also protects themselves but they want to do it for their own level of interest what they want to know so many times i do a loan <clears throat> by the time i start the guy already has an environmental report done from an environmental company and this is something the lender will accept because the lender is not getting messed up by it see when it comes to an appraisal there's an opinion so usually a person follows the opinion of the person who hired them so if i hire someone say by the way i think this building is really a beautiful building nice is in the neighborhood and i think it's worth 10 million dollars you could be sure if I'm the one always ordering appraisals, he wants my account, he's gonna come in a $10 million appraisal. If I tell him, I'm really nervous. People think it's worth 10 million, I only think nine and a half. You can be sure he's gonna come in at nine and a half. Now, he's not gonna come in at 10 or nine and a half if it's not, if he can't back it up with comps. But if he can, many times an appraisal goes for the easy route and they back and they, and, and they backfill it. They say, oh, the guy wants 10 million, let me try to find backup stories to, to make it worth 10 million versus starting from scratch. A lot of regulation because of this issue came up. The regulation that came up is that they no longer saw the email that was sent out. They no longer let the borrower order the appraiser. They no longer let the loan officer at the bank order. In many institutions, appraiser has to get ordered. A totally separate department orders the appraiser. They go out to the appraiser and they put out a bid at random. They say, which of you want, how much are you going to charge me and what's your turnaround time to do to appraise this property at this and this address? And, and the 20 approved Appraising, appraisal companies from that lender will put in bids. They'll pick the lowest at random, whatever it is like that, they pick an appraiser. They don't tell the appraiser what the purchase price is. They send the appraiser out to the property, appraise the property. He's appraising in the dark for the most part. 
and he comes back to pray. I don't believe, actually, at the end of the day, it's really in the dark, because I believe somewhere along the chain, he figures out what, the, what value someone's looking for, because if he doesn't hit his values, on one end, if he appraises too high, then he's in trouble, he'll go sad. If he doesn't hit his targets, no one's going to use him. Now, as a mortgage broker, I don't have the power which appraiser I use, but usually I could, I could veto an appraiser I don't want to use. So if I have a bad experience with appraiser A, I go to the bank and say, listen, do me a favor, order the appraiser, but please don't use A. Usually they'll honor that. And then they'll use other appraisers in, 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 through, in, in the process there. So they, with environmental, on the other hand, the bank is not nervous. That someone, they're not lending money based on the environmental. They just want to make sure someone signed off that it's good. <clears throat> and the reason why they cover to a large extent is that someone who is doing an environmental report is not really, if they're certified, they're licensed, they're not going to play games. Their whole livelihood's at stake. So <clears throat> they're probably not giving a different answer to an owner, to a seller, to a, a lender. It's all the same answer. There's an issue, there's no issue. And it's, it's a statement of fact. And the last report is an engineering report. This reviews the structure and condition of the building. Lenders, buyers, and sellers all look at this report differently. <clears throat> so on the engineering report, this is a very important part of the report. This is the report that almost every single buyer orders himself first. Because most people assume in certain neighborhoods they know there's no environmental issues here. If, you know, certain, certain areas, they know it's just regular residential, there's no problems, and they don't order it up front. But engineering, they would order, especially in a case where they look at the building, they want to know structurally, is there anything wrong with the building? Because this really affects their investment. They're buying $10 million in this building. They walk through the building, and they saw $200,000 worth of work that has to get done. The parking garage has to be repaved. They need this fixed up here and that fixed there, $200,000. So they know they bought the building at $10 million knowing that they have a $200,000 cost. But they want to spring down and an engineer would come down and say, what are you talking about? These are all the things I find wrong with the property. And based on the list, what I find wrong with the property, then I, you know, I, I'm as the buyer, I could say, I'm not spending $10 million, all these problems, I'm spending $9 million, $8 million, $7 million, $4 million. These are the numbers that I want to go ahead and, and pay for the property. Also, when it says why the lenders, buyers, and sellers look at differently, here's the story how it works. If I'm the buyer of the property, <clears throat> it's in my best interest to get an engineering report that shows a lot of problems. So I could use that to negotiate with the seller and then decide what I really care for, what's really important. So I'd love him to show me a million dollars in problems, go back to the seller, negotiate my price from 10 million to 9 million or somewhere in the middle, and I save on it. When the reality is the problems that I really plan on fixing and are really an issue will cost me only $400,000 or Maybe there is a million dollars worth of problems. The items are correct. But the engineer is using pricing. I know I get it done much cheaper than that. If I get it cheaper than that, I can also get it done for pricing. Either there's line items I don't agree with or the pricing. The, the seller, on the other hand, wants to show perfect building. Don't give any discount. Now, lenders don't care really. For a lender, it's just simple. Whatever the engineer report comes up with, make sure there's enough money put in escrow in order to cover it. So obviously they don't want to they don't want to go into a building that you know has so much work and issues and problems unless they're really comfortable you're gonna fix it. But that's all they care about. So a lot of times you have sometimes some of these situations where buyer and seller are negotiating, and then sometimes I have a deal where uh, the, the, the buyer will tell me, my engineering report, go order it yourself, even though it has his own. And he agree buyers and sellers agree we're gonna use this one versus the one the bank orders. Because it's irrelevant what the bank's looking at. Because the, the buyer is going to talk to the seller, this is the price. And I don't want to keep the lender involved. And some of the lenders' business, how we do it. I'm willing to buy the building anyway for $10 million because I'll be able to do it over the next 10 years. But if the lenders saw this report, they're going to require me to put the $400,000 up front day one. It will throw off my returns and it won't be as good. So to, to, what I found personally, this is my personal opinion on this whole entire page. My personal opinion on the page is so you want to live in a world of transparency. You don't end up winning by trying to hide one part from a different party. And the way we built our business in total is always full disclosure up front. So you want to walk over, I'd rather be in a situation where everyone looks at the same appraisal, same insurance policy, same title insurance, same legal docs, same environmental, same engineering. And then we come to the table and work out why each party should be fine with that result at the end of the day. And the lender, <laughs> even though it says it needs $400,000 worth of work, and the buyer got a discount based on it. Between me and you, we're your hat lender. 
as far as your loan is concerned, what are you really concerned about? So you only got a four hundred thousand dollars discount. Don't make him put that four hundred thousand dollars in escrow because he says he's going to do the work. As far as you're concerned, for your loan, does he have to do the work for your loan? No. Some of these items he's doing to make the building a little bit nicer is his own decision. He's doing it. It doesn't affect you. So you'd rather work at that negotiation instead of having it that there's three different reports and no one shows the other person. At the end of the day, things come up later on. And I find that if you're in a business of trust, and every part of the real estate business is a trust thing, is a trust. If you speak to a seller, why did he go with this buyer? He trusts he's going to close. I, he could have got every single building that's for sale. He could have got a, a little bit higher of a purchase price, guaranteed. There was definitely someone out there that offered him more money. But does he trust the person's going to close? When I when a seller tells me I'm selling this building for this price, do I trust the seller that everything he's telling me is honest? When I go to my broker, he tells me mortgage broker says I get you this loan. Do I trust him? He's, I can deliver that, or he's saying it because he wants to win the assignment. And same thing with the lender. The test of trust, the proof of trust, is when you have these stories that you walked away from. I tell people so many times. It's that when you get stuck, when you get questioned on a certain, you know, a certain test. Right now, I could pull up the sale, but and it might ruin my reputation, but not, and I could get away with it. At the end of the day, how are you going to care for that 10 years from now? You're going to reflect on the story, how are you going to describe that story? And I'd always want to be in the situation of trust, to be able to look back and be honest and say, you know something, this is what I'm holding, and, and walk on, and walk on, and, and, walk, and, and walk away from something that's bad, or go into a full disclosure type of situation. Contracts. You want an experienced real estate attorney to draw, draw up, review your contract or letter of intent. The reason why you want an experienced attorney, real estate attorney is because there's so many nuances that could, take, that could come, up, come up and play. And so many things that could go ahead and make that big difference in that one word of a contract or the what-if scenarios. But I want to say a very, very important thing. So you have to remember, the reason why an attorney is an attorney and not you as an entrepreneur it's because an attorney's job is to find problems. That's their job. If you bought a building and they didn't protect you, how did they protect you? They noticed something wrong with the contract. They protected you. Their job, people that make the most money that I found using attorneys is they use an attorney that is able to work with them on a basis where the attorney flags them the problems and they make the business decisions. People make the mistake when they go ahead and they turn to their attorney and they let the attorney, I call up a person, whatever my attorney says, that's what I'm doing. I don't understand, are you crazy? Your attorney is your attorney, okay? Because he, he's great at flagging things. If he's great at making business decisions, your attorney's not as wealthy as you are. There's a reason for that. And at the end of the day, you may take the risk and reward. Your attorney's not there to take the risk. Your attorney's there to tell you all the flags. No, nope, I follow my attorney. I said, I want to ask you a question. You're buying this building for $10 million. If I told you right now that if you close by tomorrow, you get the same exact building for seven and a half, within seven and a half million dollars, would you still trust your attorney? Or then you'd be willing to go ahead, oh, if that's the case, I'll buy it. So make every decision yourself. Let your attorney flag you the issues. And if the attorney flags you, flags you the issues, be informed. What an inter a great attorney does, he informs you of the issues. That's number one as a mindset. And for the same exact token, People ask me a lot of times when I give these courses, how am I giving these courses online? Part of it goes to a certain extent into YouTube. And even if I tell, I pull it down off YouTube. One of you, so until now, downloaded it somewhere. So here I am, you can take what I'm writing over here and sell it to an attorney. My opinion is the same when I talk to an attorney. That's my saying on the page before about full disclosure and upfront. I don't hide my opinion of an attorney. A great, the best attorneys in the world are attorneys that are problem solving attorneys. They flag problems and they're able to sit with the client and help them make a business decision that makes things work. When I do loans, a certain attorneys stall the process because all they do, it's very easy to raise flags all day long. And don't forget, attorneys get paid by the hour. It's very easy to do that. The greatness of an attorney is for an attorney to flag a problem and come with a creative problem solving solution to move forward. And also put a dollar amount as a problem to this and tell the client, listen, here's a problem. But the reality risk is, don't just give the problems and, and create fear. Even if you can't problem solve, create the problem and then clearly tell the client, this is a problem, but between me and you, this problem is only real and can only, is only, the biggest mistake can happen is worth 10 grand. So as an owner could say, 
is it worth holding up or walking from the deal because of this? Would I buy this building for 9,990,000? And many times the attorney tells you all the worst case scenario. You don't need an attorney to tell you the worst case scenario. I can tell you worst case scenarios on every single step of the process. But you make calculated risk. Like I tell people, if you think about it, how does life insurance companies work? How do they insure people? Everybody will die. So how do they sell you a policy for a few hundred dollars, depending on your age, and insure you for a million dollars? You will die. They're going to lose $9,999,500 if you die this year. But the answer is that you'll follow statistics, probabilities. And some people are a little more conservative or less, but they take an overall statistic and the overall probability and they make a decision. And that's the same thing that's over here. If you're looking for an attorney, you want an attorney that is going to flag you on the problems and advise you and help you get to solutions that you can move forward. Not just to ring the bell, there's problems. And later on, no matter what you do, if things go sour, I told you so. You can't do business that way. But sometimes people are new, they like that attorney, it takes control of them. It's a mistake. You got this far because of your entrepreneurial spirit. You want the attorney to make sure when you're making a decision, you have more facts. Most entrepreneurs who made mistakes, they didn't make bad calls and have the facts in front of them. Most of them that made mistakes, they didn't have all the facts in front of them. A great attorney will give you those facts in front of you. That's why I once met someone who was looking to do investments. And before he does an investment, he goes to his accountant, he has an accountant and an attorney to review the, the docs and review the numbers. He said, I don't understand, why don't you start negotiating yourself, see if it's real or not? He says, you know why? Because I learned all, over all the years. He asked, do I lose a lot of money? Because he could tell me not to do the deal and I wasn't gonna do it anyway. And I, I could have saved a few thousand dollars having my attorney review it. But I learned the other way around. As an entrepreneur, I get emotion involved. And if I go down the line too far, and then the attorney tells me there's a problem, I'm not walking. And if you look at any person that goes through life and have regrets about relationships or partnerships or marriage that didn't work out, they look back here, they kind of flag it, but they were too far down the line. I'd rather know this idea makes sense to me. But before I go even a step further, I'm bringing in my attorney and my accountant to review the numbers and flag me. So when I start negotiating, I'm negotiating with all these points in front of me up front, and I'm aware of what's going on. The main contracts that are dealt with is the contract of sale. That's the agreement between the buyer and the seller. And they want to make sure that all the terms and everything that you need inside there is, is in there and done properly and correct. The next thing is typically for buyers, I'm buying this property today. I need a JV, which stands for Joint Venture Operating Agreement. What's the relationship between me and all my partners that I'm bringing into this deal? I'm buying the building for 10 million, I need to put two and a half million dollars. I'm putting in 500,000 of my own money. I have four people at $500,000 each. Or we syndicate it out for him. We find him, we have an equity division here, we find him partners to invest. He has one for 100,000, 200,000. His agreements, how do they all come together? It's a joint venture operating agreement. The next thing is, comes to get a loan. And then down the line, the bank issues a commitment and the closing docs. And they say, we're going to lend you this amount of money. And what's our relationship going to be from the time we close until you pay off the lender? And all the what if scenarios that can happen could go wrong from the time you close, from between now and closing to make sure what happens, something happens between now and closing. And then from the time you close, until you have to get repaid the loans. And then in the process, review the leases. Depending on the property, sometimes people hire an attorney to review all the leases just to make sure that the rights that the landlord and tenant have. Usually the reviewing of a lease by an attorney is typical by a commercial lease. Because there they want to make sure what rights does the landlord have. And may, sometimes the tenant could have had a reimbursement they haven't paid, have it noticed. It so kicked in four years ago on a 20 year lease, 16 years in, the original owner sold it, forgot about it. Things again, the technology today, every lease that happens today, there's something called a lease synopsis, which basically sums up the main bullet points, the business terms of a lease. So today there's so many off the shelf software programs that you could track all the bullet points on the lease. So a landlord is never running into an issue. A landlord does it, deals with a transaction today and they know it will flag them in, hey, in four years from now, don't remember that you're supposed to adjust A, B, C, D, and E. Think about 20 years ago. Think about before the internet, even the work computers. But no one had custom programs written for these things. It was too costly to write those types of programs. So landlords kept notes to themselves, reminding. I remember, even till today, what I find the most amazing part of commercial real estate, the very secretive business owners keep all their information secretive. But if you walk over to the, the average owner, he does not have a list of all his properties that he owns. And in his, he'll tell you at the top of his head, he doesn't have a place that has a list of his buildings. 
And if he does, it's a, oh, I have an Excel spreadsheet so my, one of my workers put together a few months ago and have a list of it. Or they have a, literally a handwritten list. And that list is typically sorted when the next loan comes due. That's the output. They may have a property management software today to manage their properties, and whichever's on that software platform, they can print out a report of that list and the other day. There's no one place that puts it all together for them. And the reason, the main reason is because they're very secretive. So who should they give this information to? Which vendor are they dealing with that has to have this information? Nobody. They don't have a system to put. One of the things which we built and we're working on and on the app end of it, is once I built the technology, I already track each owner his schedule real estate. So once I have the technology built, I have a way for an owner to see a list of his properties. But there's no, there's no person out there that collects this. So when people look at the lease, imagine just a lease. You think they have all the rent bumps and step ups in the commercial lease? Today they do. Today they have departments because there's off the shelf programs and apps and software that just tracks one segment of every part. And just realize, you know who needed it? It didn't stop by a landlord. Who needed it? A mortgage broker, a leasing broker. Because the leasing broker calls up an owner and says, oh, I would like to know you have any vacancies. He says, no, I don't have any vacancies. I'm gonna have one in two years from now. Oh yeah, who's, who's there? Oh, that store is coming due in two years. So at that point, he'll want to store the information when next to call the owner. And slowly but surely, in different stages of the process, a leasing broker signs a lease. He wants a tickler, a reminder for himself, in five years to remind him to call back the landlord. So the, the brokerage side of the community built this as lead generation for themselves. And it's outside. So and after a while, once it's built, they can license it to an owner the same exact way to help owners keep track of different things. I'm sure the list, five minutes of what we just discussed, if someone's watching the same thing in a year from now, and two years from now, four years from now, five years from now, I like just said, we're totally stale and outdated, as there'd be better systems in place that everyone will have. What do you mean? People don't never had this? Of course, this is how it works. The most success, understanding real estate finance, page, section two, page 22. The most successful real estate moguls achieve their prominence by having a keen understanding of real estate finance. This is very, very key and especially today. And the proof is how we got to the especially today. Real estate, as he said a few times, has up until now been all about bricks and mortar. Person buys a building, they look, typically when I used to take an owner to go look at a building, he focuses energy first on the location. Look around, look at the building, look at the condition of the building. <clears throat> Second, he looked for the rent building numbers, but first with the building. And Buildings used to trade at a multiple, a multiple times rent. So if the income of the building is $100,000, they'll sell for four hundred thousand dollars five hundred thousand dollars If they found there's a little bit of a mistake, got an extra lease signed in the middle, lost the lease, didn't make a difference. The price was based on primarily the bricks. What is a building worth? What is the replacement cost? What does it cost to build this building? It cost me three million to build it. The building is for sure worth three million. Today has nothing to do with that. That's like the last item on the list. The first item is the numbers. Someone anywhere sitting in the all, all over the world could decide to buy a building. Especially Google Maps, they zoom in, that's they bought a building. They rely more on the engineering report now because that's who knows the condition of the building. But the person who understood financing made all the difference in how he's able to get his deal done because the building sold for $10 million. And the reason why it sold for $10 million is because of, you know, Going back, so for t I'll, I'll finish this one thought and I'll go back to, to a, a deal that I once did in Maryland. But a deal for $10 million, and he's promising returns to investors, 10% return. And he's able to get himself a lower interest rate than someone else can. Or I'm able to bring him mezzanine money, money above a first mortgage, something between a first mortgage and, and, and equity, somewhere in the middle. And it comes out that with that, he can promise investors 12% on their money, then he says, you know something, I'm about to lose this, this building. There's people building ten, bidding 10 million. I can afford to pay 10.5 million. Because even at 10.5 million, I three, still throw 10% return. So he would quote unquote overpay for the building. People thought he's crazy. And meanwhile, what's crazy about it? Right now, the numbers work for what I need him. He's even better. He works out the math that he might even be able to store up an 11% return to his investors. So by understanding financing, he's able to get himself a better deal, could afford to pay the right pricing and squeeze out a better return. So when he looks at a deal, he focuses on the finance. So he set an example, going back before the Baltimore, about a Walmart lease, or going out a lease for Walgreens. Walgreens will sign a lease, and if you don't understand financing, 
what's better, a 20-year Walgreen lease that's paying $100,000 a year or a 25-year Walgreen lease that's paying $95,000 a year? Most people will choose the $100,000. For the next 20 years, I'd rather get $100,000 than 95 dollars I'm losing. So I get five extra years, I'll deal in 20 years, I'll see what the world is like. But if you're into financing, you got yourself a 25-year lease, you're able to borrow much more money on this property because you can amortize the payments over 25 years to the lender, your monthly your, your payments. You can borrow more because the payments could work. So you could borrow more money at 95000 So understanding how financing works, you go through the mortgage guy and play with those numbers. How much can you borrow on a 20-year payout? Even if you, even if you had $100,000 available to you, take a 120 debt service coverage on a 20-year payout versus a 120 coverage on a 30-year on a 25-year payout. So you can borrow a lot more money even though you only have $95,000 available to you. So if you only said financing, you'd structure better deals for yourself because you focus on the financing, not just one dynamic. <clears throat> so I remember when I first came into the business, I did a loan in Baltimore. And at that time, the whole market in Baltimore, really, Wall Street was first starting to come into play, but it was focusing for the most part on major cities. And Baltimore didn't qualify at that time. Today, it's across the country, it's the same. So the guy was buying a building for, I, I remember the numbers, like, he was looking for a loan of like $5 million on like, on, like, on like 250 units. So he was looking for a loan, the equivalent of $20,000 a unit, something along those lines. And I remember, you know, I was all proud. I closed the loan and worked on a deal. And I meet, you know, the next person, oh, and I, and I got permission to say that I'm working on that deal. And the person says, oh, you're the guy financing it? Yeah, I heard some crazy guy from New York came down that financing these deals. The building's not worth it. What are you guys doing? I'm not looking like he's crazy. In New York, that same building at that time, we get a loan for seven or eight million dollars. So he goes, we're not in New York. I said, well, I understand. Money is money. At the end of the day, if I have a million dollars in my hand and I can make myself a return on the million dollars, if a building could throw off this return, why would I buy in different markets? I couldn't send better neighbors, worse neighbors. This was in the best neighborhood in Baltimore. So it's a safe neighborhood. Everything is great. Like I understand there's a difference in different markets, but not that much of a difference. And that's the example before the world, you know, what the internet did is it made everything pretty, pretty efficient. You don't have the ability to, you know, buy in one neighborhood to a different neighborhood as a huge discrepancy. There's a pretty good handle on the whole entire country's outline. Same thing with currency. You can't use, like I said, you used to be able to trade dollars or pounds for shekel and back and make money just doing that. Today it doesn't work that way. It's exactly balanced. And everything works out streamlined. So this guy thought I was crazy. You know, the buyer said the fact that he found himself a lender, a Wall Street lender from New York, who's focusing on the financing, he's going to buy up a storm. And during these years, this guy bought up thousands and thousands and thousands of units because he overpaid in everyone else's opinion in that market because they thought he's crazy. And the people throwing money at him. In hindsight, he wasn't crazy. Now, sometimes you have crazy, is crazy, and it stays crazy, and they lose their money because they're crazy. But in this case, he's looking at logic-based and going through the math at the bottom, and it was all working out fine, and it worked out. And so the, talking about understanding financing, he understood the financing game and understood this is the way to structure transactions. To the same extent, this is what caused the crash in 2007, 2008, because people kept taking it to the next level. We're, when I saw somebody was buying a building for $10 million, all of a sudden he goes out and he buys a building for 100. I said, how are you buying it for 100? He goes, what do you mean? Now that I understand all the math, it works out better for me. I found myself somebody, it's easier to get institutional money would write bigger checks. So for the same work, they're not gonna write checks only for a million dollars, they'll write checks for 10 million. So when I buy for $100 million a deal, I get more sophisticated people involved. This person will go up to 80%. So I got myself eight, $80 million loan. And the institutions will write a check for me for $15 million because they'll give you 75% of the equity. They'll be my partners. I only have to come up with $5 million to buy this building. So for the same $5 million, I was coming up with a $20 million building because I had to come the bank and my friends and family. But now there's another entity called, I could, I could find institutional partners. So I go out tomorrow morning, I find the partner who'll give me 75% of the equity and he'll put up $15 million. And bottom line is, I don't have to come up with $5 million. And for my friends and family, they were getting a better return on that five million than they were they'd get if they bought the building for 20 million because they got so much leverage on the deal. The competition became so crazy then that when we were doing loans at the end, 
before the market crashed, banks were lending, Wall Street was lending 85 to 90% on a deal. Because what happened, the Wall Street lender, two guys went to college together. One guy became a lender, one guy opened up an equity fund, was investing hedge fund money and all these types of things. They both are best friends. They're looking at each other and saying, I'm lending money, 80% leverage, and I'm collecting a 6% interest rate. So that was the rate. You're going up from 80 to 95. You're giving the next level on the capital stack, bringing up to, ni- to, not to, to, to $95 million. And you're making 14% on your money. I think real estate's only getting better and better. So maybe I wouldn't stretch all the way to 95%, but I'd rather go to 90. <clears throat> I go back home, the next day I call up, whoever comes to me, you know something from now on, instead of a 6% interest rate, I'm getting only $80 million, you pay me 7%, I'll go all the way up to 90 million. All day long, I was getting business all day long. This guy, on the other hand, was also happier to a certain extent because he was lending from 90 to 95 million. He's able to collect 18% on that. There's enough extra fat in the system to pay him a higher rate just for that last few difference. And then the competition kept coming up that eventually people got 98% financing when they did loans. So now I meet this guy again with a $100 million building. He says, for me, it's a no-brainer. By a $100 million building, I have to come up with $2 million. I don't have any partners. I'm allowed to, they will let me put a, an acquisition fee when I buy the building of 1%. So I have a fee of one in my total cost. At a total cost, my purchase price is 100 million, plus 1 million is, my, is a fee to me in closing costs. My closing costs are another million, so I'm in for 102 million. Let's say, it was, let's go better to keep the numbers around. There's $98 million was the purchase price, $2 million is closing costs. But in the 2 million, 1 million is me. I put up an acquisition fee of $980,000. That happens now. You do a building today, the syndicator typically will take an acquisition fee. How does he make money? He closes the deal. And he goes, I found the deal. I put in money, effort, and anything. I get a fee. I bought the building for $12 million. I get a $120,000 fee. Plus, I get an, almost a million dollar fee. I'm doing property management on the property. The property management on this property works out to $500,000 a year. I have money in the bank, and in two years, I'll make back the money. And now that's non recourse. So of course buildings went sour at that point. The person actually bought the building, it's called the owner, put in $2 million. I saw a building for sale once that has four years left to the lease. So the, the grocery anchor has four or five years left to the lease. So instead of selling for 98 million, it's only worth 94 million. This guy bought it anyway, 96 million. So are you crazy? What do you mean, what am I crazy? I, how much do I have to come up to buy the building? The bank wants money in reserve. I made a calculation, very simple, I ran the math. And based on how much money I'm making on the deal, by the time the lease comes due, even if they don't, they don't renew, I have all my money out. Because the cash flow of the building today is throwing off a mil- $2 million, let's say. So it's like $2 million a year in profit. After the mortgage, after everything. Plus my acquisition, plus this. I have $8 million. I need $4 million to buy the building. $3 million in reserve on this scenario. I have to come up with $7 million. Worst case scenario, when I go to my investor, they guys, worst case will break even. And if the guy renews, it's a grand slam. So understanding financing, he structured deals differently. The typical real estate owner wouldn't pay that much for the building because he's looking at it wearing a different hat. It's a lot of risk here. You don't pay that much for the risk. But that's why things went sour because he didn't care for going sour. See, a lot of times when I would finance a building, I tell a bank, listen, I know you're nervous, but this big real estate guy's buying the building. He's, he's willing to put down more equity than normal. He's willing to put $3 million in an account. I remember selling it on his behalf, not knowing his story. And the bank said, the truth is, they went to the community and said, listen, yeah, there's a good chance the tenant's gonna renew anyway. Right? Why should I assume it's not gonna renew? And if Blank is buying it and doing all this, so a, after all, everything just became believable stories. Then one day, it didn't happen. And then, and he just walked from his building, couldn't care, and the domino effect happened overnight. Because it wasn't just in one area people stretched. They stretched in every single area under the sun. And the, the areas that they stressed under the sun were that I'm buying a building tomorrow morning. The rents in the area are $25 a foot. This tenant is paying 12. The lease is coming due in 18 months. I tell the bank, I don't want to negotiate with him now. I want him to leave. Give me credit as if 25. Before you knew it, banks were giving credit and underwriting the building as if $25 income is there already. They'll hold back and reserve the difference of the cash flow just in case. And then it came to fruition. And this time, before you knew it, Everyone just following the next person, herd mentality, and that's where things collapsed overnight. But even today, on, on, the, on the right part, finance works. Today, you're also getting 98% that was saying. 
The difference is the banks are healthier. No bank is going above 75 or 80%. Who's taking the risk? The people should take it, equity funds. So I could go out and find a fund that will give you in the equity division, we're brokering deals where the fund puts up 80 or 90% of the equity required. So a $10 million deal, the bank is only giving 8 million. There's, tw there's, there's $2 million that's needed. On that $2 million, a fund comes in and says, I'll put up 8 million. I'll put up of the 2 million, I'll put up 80%. I'll put up a million six or 90%, a million eight, as long as you put in money. But who's that person putting it up? A fund, which is like a real estate owner and just structure their deal that works better for them to do it this way than buying the building outright. So if the market goes sour now, who's losing out? Rich people, rich people are losing out. They're losing out, but that's what's supposed to happen. They took the risk. Then this wealthy, and they're getting the 12, 18, 24% returns, why? Because they have the ability to get their returns to go up to that next level of, of getting the returns to make things work because they're taking that level of risk. How to leverage, what sort of lenders, how long of a loan? So this is part of it. Is it better on this deal to take a three-year loan, take a five-year loan, a seven-year loan, a 10-year loan? Is the benefit of a 10-year loan is the interest rate gets locked for 10 years. That's the benefit. But maybe on this loan, it's better. Don't wait for 10 years. I don't care if interest rates go up. I'd rather interest rates go up, but I have so much room to cash out. And what's better for me? To take a loan and pay 4% today for five years and take a million, $2 million from investors and pay them their return. I'm locked in for, all, for only for five years. In five years from now, rates might go to 5%. I'm worse off. But in those five years from now, I could probably refinance even at 5% rates and be able to take out from the five years from now, be able to take out on this building a, a loan of, you know, another million and a half. And I could return to the investors at 1.5 million. So who, what do I really care about? Not the interest rate of the loan, it's just one segment of it. I care about my return. By doing it this way, I'm paying a higher percent of 5%. But who cares, they only have 500,000 invested. On an IRR basis, I'm better off. What sort of lenders do you go with? Do you want an easy prepayment penalty, a tougher prepayment penalty, a bank that has this kind of reserve will give you this benefit. This perk and not that perk. How long of a loan should you take? That all goes together. And with what amount of leverage do you take on these transactions? Nobody built a real estate empire by claiming to be a better property manager than their peers and competitors. That's the key thing. And I need a real estate owner. Okay, it's very nice. He has property management. It's important. It's very nice. He has, he, he knows, he knows a lot of different things. But that's not when he says, I got here because I'm a great property manager. He got here because he bought right and he financed right. And within the word I bought right, was I bought the deal knowing that I could structure it the way I want to go ahead and structure it. All these other points are very important. So you're right, the best owners probably also have the best property managers, the best, best, best of everything under the sun. Even if they don't have the best, they definitely don't have the worst. They don't have problems with any of the departments that they're working with. But that's the key thing to realize. Interview any owner. What's your key to success? It's not how you manage the properties. Speak to a property manager, that's the key to success. They're on the, they're on the money. They're always, they're always listening in. They always see when they can cut expenses. They always catch things. That, that's the property manager. But the guy buying it falls down to a big part of the financing. It is the return on your investment that counts most. The only thing that matters, like I started the whole entire course, I have a million dollars in the bank. What am I going to do with that? I have a million dollars in my hand. What am I going to do with it? I put it in the bank, I get this return. I put it here, I get that return. I invest it in real estate, risk and reward, I get this return. That's the most important point that counts. Everything else is a game to get there. And it's a game with structure I should do. So that's why when you're a mortgage broker, I meet someone who's a new mortgage broker, I can't understand the guy. It's a much better deal if I'm taking this over this. I said, really? Do you know what he's doing with his money? So when I meet an owner sometimes, and an owner tells me, as I talk to everyone, always fact find. And an owner tells me, I have an option. I could buy a building for 80%, I get an interest rate of 6%, 80% leverage, or 75%, my interest rate is 5%. What should I do? Depends what's your alternative. If the way you're getting that other 5% would be to take partners, that you're promising them an 8 or 10% return on their money first, what's the blended average? Are you better off with which one over the next, number one? Number two, forget about what you're paying them. Run the scenario. If you only had to put down $2 million on a $10 million deal, and you had a 6% interest rate, what would your IRR be? Cash and cash be. That's what the calculator is built for in the app. But if you only had to put down two and a half million dollars, you got the money at 5%. Which one's better? That's the only thing that should matter. The only other possibility that can matter is, is it possible 
for me to raise two and a half million dollars. Maybe I can't. I only have enough to, I only have two million dollars I can raise. But assuming you have all the options to raise the money, run which, which number, which math makes the most sense. And that's what your focus point should be. Now, is there a consideration if I take too much debt on the property, I might have a problem and go under? Obviously, you're talking about someone who did his normal due diligence. When you come back and say, this building is worth $10 million, and this is what it could afford, and the payments could afford the payments, where would you rather be? In what scenario would you rather be? In? You have to look at what's your own personal interest as the buyer. Are you better off structurally to have lower debts because it helps you in different areas? What happens if you only have to raise $2 million? Can you now get away with owning a better piece of the deal? Maybe it's, it's actually a worse deal for you on the numbers side. Math-wise, the IRR, the returns, you're better off taking 75%. However, if you only needed to raise $2 million, you're able to give away 60% of the building for the $2 million. But if you need to raise $2.5 million, you'll have to go away 70%. So even though it's a worse return, but for you, in long term, I'll own 40% of this building instead of 30% of this building. So I don't care about the interest rate I'm paying now. I'd rather own 40% of a building that's not making as much money than 30% of a building that's making more. Because 40, that difference, I'm better off. So it always depends who you're focusing on. So that's the same thing. An owner, just like an owner buys a building, if he understands the bricks and we can bring the rent to and all that, and he understands how financing works, he can make himself a better deal, I'm the same way in reverse. I win a lot more of my assignments, not because the other broker promises 3% and I can promise 3%, or 4% and 4%, or 7% to 75 Many times it's a structure. What's the structure that's better for you? And sometimes I meet someone who's paying a 10-year loan because it's more important. He takes a five-year loan because he wants to cash out in five years. But he's, what happens if, if the value, the rates really go up too high? He might not be able to take out as much as he wants to. What happens if rents don't go up? So he's stuck again. What happens if I could structure a deal that allows him the one-time option to have no prepayment penalty at the end of year five? So if he decides he has a 10-year loan, so it's the benefit of being locked in, but he has the option, if he, if he wants to refinance one time with this bank in these circumstances, that might be a better solution for him. So on paper, I might not be able to beat my, comp my competitor. I'm the same, but with a structure that works better for him, I'm in a better situation. That's why when I meet an owner, I tell him everything is even, who wins? If his answer to me is, I'm using the other broker, I wouldn't take on the assignment. Because 99% of the time, are the same. I would say, if I come up with an idea, a creative idea, are you going to go back to the other broker to match it? Well, then I wouldn't. If he commits to me for that, then fine. There's a respect to the value I bring to the table on the creativity to work the transaction. So it is the return of your investment that counts most. And grasping the keys, the key points of financing have the largest effect on your returns. So I want to go on the next page just very quickly so that you know who the people are and the players are and where it's relevant to you. Everyone's cell number is here and the email address. And on my own self, I applied every single email before the business, before I go to sleep. So if I get an email, if you didn't get a response by that night, then I didn't get your email. So you could ask any question. But I'd rather, if it's possible, if there's people in the office that you have questions, that you can ask the questions to, to get you the answers you want, and have experts in the field. A lot more people, obviously, in the company, but for the most part, put heads of departments here. So my partner in the whole business is Abraham Bergman, and he focuses more, between myself and him, he focuses more on any of the legal questions, the, the detailed questions, exactly how appraisal working contracts and all those things, if more detailed questions, he'll probably be more focused for those answers. He can answer the same questions I can answer, but that's where more of his expertise is. Mark Belsky runs the equity division. He knows real estate cold. So when you, you have a, someone's looking to buy a building and wants equity, and that's all my financing, he's the player for you to give you the, the, the knowledge about, the, about, the, about that, that side of the business. Yitzi Hanlon works alongside him on the equity side, Yitzi is more of the salesperson type for that part of the business. So if you have a client, you want to win over the client, you want to talk to the client, you yourself want someone to spend more time with you and, and in the hopes, like a salesman, in the hopes that's going to benefit you know, with you, Yitzi is more of the alley. You want to get the bottom line results, they work together to run it. But like I tell people that, you know, when you want to go out to, to you have a choice to go to the be best be doctor, doesn't have the greatest bedside manner, or the second best, I'm going to have different choices. When it comes to getting the information, Mark Belsky is not into the sales side of it. So if he's going to look at the deal and right away tell you if it makes sense, doesn't make sense, you're buying a good deal, bad deal. So some people like that, and some people, it's too blunt for them. So depending on the style that you want. Phil Crispin runs healthcare. 
so to regular more debt business, but healthcare has more of a more of a uh, specialty, and that's his expertise. And again, you're not going to find anyone in the country that, listen, to my knowledge, we, we worked off of that has an expertise in healthcare. So no one's going to know the business better than him. And that business, it's by on my end of it, it's very simple: the interest rate and what how your investors are. And if a guy walks to me and says, "I'm buying the building with my own money," and all it pretty much boils down to. What is opinion of interest rates are going up or down? What's the best rate you could get? Not that much in there. Has refinance. When it comes to healthcare, there's a million moving parts. The people literally who came in here is able to save their life because they thought they're in trouble. And he's able to show them understanding how the whole healthcare business works. And on the financing side, it's not just an interest rate and a loan amount. Moshe Finer and Aaron Kleiman co-run QTS, which is quotes and term sheets. That's the banking department of the company. So when someone has a question, and before they want to talk to a broker in the office, let's say they don't have a relationship with a broker here in the office. They want to just talk to someone who can give them the answer they need and then even advise them who might be better suited to help them run it. Two of them, most of the is the main one running on the deals and, and Kleiman is, is on the banking relationships. They'll give you that information. When you're using the app and there's an Ask QTS button, if you're, if you're working in Eastern, you have that access to the button, the other one's controlling, their team is controlling the data that's going into those, going in there. Internally in the office, almost every single broker in the office, when they have a deal, they know instinctively who they want to send the deal to. They want to send it to bank one, bank two, and bank three. They'd run it by the QTS division to say, am I missing another bank? Who else do you recommend? That's the knowledge that they have from there. Thank you. Mm -hmm.